Oh, today, um, I really felt led, and this, and this may be going on for a, a season, if, as long as the Lord leads us, but we would take some time. I'm going to get done a little bit earlier, because I started earlier, but that you would have some more time, and the music would flow, and we'd have more music all clumped together, so you'd have time to respond to God. I believe that today, people do not, um, are ha- really struggling with God's presence, really struggling with um, a, a living Lord. Jesus is alive. He's on the throne. He sent his Holy Spirit. We are going to see the latter reign of God. We're, going to, we're about ready to see the greatest days of God's kingdom that, we, that, that honestly creation has ever had. And yet Satan's vice has always been blindness. I mean, if you, if you can think about it, um, Paul, who was formerly named Saul, who was so churchy. Ever say churchy? He was so churchy that when Jesus came, he didn't see. Do you understand? And I think so many people are so churchy, they don't see. They're blind to what God is doing. And so we're going to take, talk today about the remnant. We're going to talk about, again, this is the second message. I believe God is raising up a people. Not because he wants to be a God that just predestines one person over another, but God needs a people to help others see what they're missing. Are you going to be that people? Are you going to be that person? I want to make sure that my heart is in the right place. At 445, the Holy Spirit woke me up, and, uh, and this is what he gave to me, and I find that this is what I need to always do in my life. I don't always do this right, but I should be. And this, this when the Holy Spirit interrupts my life, then I should allow him to get first in my life in that area, amen? And that sometimes what we do is, is that, you know, the Holy Spirit will interrupt your day. Maybe he tells you to buy coffee for somebody. Maybe he tells you to go to a different gas station. Maybe he tells you to go to a different supermarket. Maybe he tells you to give, you know, a call somebody or, or Facebook somebody. And you just don't listen to it because you're just thinking, oh, that's just me. No, that's the Holy Spirit in you, moving on you to, to take one step and you know what, many times you just argue with that step, and, you know, and God's going, look, I'm not going to give you the next one until you finish this one. Well, so uh, he gave me this passage, and it's Jeremiah 18. Lest you think that I'm one of those people, I don't go into the Old Testament as quickly as I go into the New Testament, because I believe we're living in a new covenant. But God, many times, is that the old, right, God gives us the old to show us how great the new is. And so in the Old Covenant, God was speaking to Jeremiah in a time like we live in today, okay? So many times we don't get in ourselves into the story of what, who God is talking to. Jeremiah is living in uh, Judah, and is captive. He's living with a king that, doesn't want, that, that has been instructed by God to surrender to the enemy. He's been instructed to surrender. And he doesn't want to do that because, see, it's contrary to the way his mind thinks the way God would work things out. Kind of like today. Contrary to the way we think God would work things out. We're not pressing into the way that God wants to work it out. We're, it's contrary to the way we feel God would work it out in our lives, personally, corporately. And we just want to, we're still just wanting this whole season to get over with. We get mad at each other. We get mad because people aren't doing it the way we want them to do. Mask, not mask. Uh, Attending church, not attending church. Uh, We get mad at at what the government's doing, what the government's not doing. Why is one state versus another state? We become, get all in a tiz over things that we should not be. And the Bible says we don't get ourselves involved with the affairs of somebody else. It's very simple for me. If I'm, you know what? I'm not going to get involved in your situation if it's not something I'm supposed to do. Otherwise, I'm just a busy body. But what I need to do is associate and realize that I am a soldier for Jesus Christ. I remember as a little, you know, growing up in a church, uh, onward Christian soldiers. And yet today, what I see so many times is people right now, they're not Christian soldiers that they're literally blind people running around trying to figure out where the light is. Well, Spirit of God knew this hour was coming, knew what to do in this hour. He's speaking to his people. Are you listening? Are you the one? You know what? He's given us ears to hear. He's given us eyes of our spirit to see. He's wanting us to have a perceptive heart. And this is what God spoke to me about potter and the clay, Jeremiah chapter 18. 
the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you. So I did, as he told me, and I found the potter working at the wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. O Israel, can I not do to you as the potter has done to this clay? Now, I'm not saying Israel. O church, can I not do to you? Can I not do to you that what I intend to do? As a clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, tore down, and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, and I will not destroy it as I had planned, and if I announce that I will plant and build up a certain nation or a kingdom, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will bless it. I will not bless it as I had said I would. Therefore, meaning that God can change his thoughts and directions. But the people replied, don't waste your breath. We will continue to live as we want to suddenly fire our own evil desires. We are living in a time where people are so about me. You know, the church was, um, it began, and it began at the cross. There's a crossroad in everybody's life, and you surrender yourself to Jesus. All that I am is yours. And, uh, I recognize that even some of the fallacies that I have been a part of, whether it's been, you know, I, I definitely would say it was never intentional. But I can tell you as I look back at the 30-some years of ministry that I've been involved with, that I have seen a lot of me, now I'm talking about me, but a lot of me in the church. And what I can be in the church and not Christ that lives in me. And I want to read a passage I started with uh, last week that the Holy Spirit gave to me. And it's, it's in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 30. Amplified translate. And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God. Many people stop right there. God's going to work it all together because he loves me. To those who are called according to his plan and purpose. So all things are going to work together as long as I'm in the vein of his plan and his purpose. God has a plan and a pur purpose for my personal life, but also for this church corporately and for the church abroad and through the church throughout the nations. For those whom he foreknew and loved and chose beforehand, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and ultimately share in his complete sanctification so that he would be the firstborn, the most beloved and honored among many believers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified, declared free of his guilt and sin. And those whom he justified, he also glorified, raising them to a heavenly dignity. Jeremiah 29, 11, 13, another uh, favorite passage of many of us. Um, for I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. And, and many stop there. But what does it say? Why does God do that? Why does God give us, he says, I have a future, I have a plan for you, I have a destiny, I have an assignment for you. Why? Verse 12, then, then you will call on me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear your voice and I will listen to you then with a deep longing you will seek me and require me as a vital necessity and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart so today as we um, journey in this this message series of, of remnant or a, a peculiar people or a, a people that God is raising up in this chamber a, a, a latter rain people the church that becomes alive, a re, you know, revival that hits. Let me tell you something. Revival isn't about a work. It isn't about a geographic area. It isn't about a church denomination. Is it about a people that say, I want you, God, and all you I want. I'm all in. And that starts from a heart that's rendered and said, God, here I am. I'm, I'm that clay. Mold and shape me the way you want me to be. And point number one, if you're taking notes, is, it says God is calling you to an assignment. You will need to overcome the enemy's attacks. You know, um, again, I've been a, 
a study of the Word of God for years and years, and I still am, even at 4.45 in the morning, the Holy Spirit's teaching me His ways. And this is a passage that uh, this week just kind of lit up again, and it's, an, it's a passage I've read so many times. It's a passage I've preached many different times. And it's a passage where Jesus is tested. You know, when he just gets, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus goes through the baptism, and, uh, and then the Holy Spirit descends on him, and, uh, and, and it, the Bible says that he begins his work, and his first work is to overcome the enemy. I believe that today, that the remnant of God is being raised up. You need to overcome the enemy. Never has there been an era, never has there been a, such a time. The Bible says very clearly that Satan in his last days would come out with a rage because he knows his time is... Sure. I mean, let's wake up, church. We know that his time, we know his time is short. He is coming out, and he's not coming to play. Never has there been so many people blinded by the things, and never has there been such a time, even the church people grasping at things, grasping at the government, grasping at every other situation except Christ. I don't hear Christ in people's dialogue today, and I am including myself in the church People that I know that are people that, that have made themselves church-going people, they're not talking about Christ. They're not talking about who He is. They're not talking about the cross. They're not talking about the resurrection power. They're not talking about the healer. They're not talking about the provider. What they're talking about is their struggles. And I know that their struggles, and we know that the enemy is going to bring those struggles. But who is it that overcomes those struggles? Christ that lives inside of you. And your victory doesn't happen on the outside until you are victorious on the inside the victory always lives on the inside and I, I can share in fact my wife and I were just saying I went I don't understand that you know I've never been busier in my life as of today in fact I had tried to plan this summer and I, I had actually got my sons involved and I thought by having my sons involved that I would have been my workload or my weight load or my Burden would have been reduced by 67%. I'm one third. And yet, God happened to bless the business 300%. So you can imagine people go, Yo, you look really tan. Why ain't having fun in the sun, people? Okay. I'm here to say, though, that Christ is stronger in my life no matter if I'm working 14 hour days. Because it's not about my circumstances. It's about what's going on in my heart. And that God can still wake me up, and if I'm going on four hours sleep or no sleep, Jesus is bigger inside of here. And that I don't need adrenaline to keep going. I need Christ to keep going. And that I need to get in front of this thing with who Christ is. And what really hit me is that here's Jesus. And the first thing the Father brings him to, okay, now Jesus lived 30 years, submitted to an inferior scenario, which means he knew more, he had more understanding, he had more power, he had more creativity, he had everything he knew, and I see so many people today that are filled with knowledge and maybe even know more than their boss, and they can't, I'm going to say the word, shut up and surrender. I mean, I, honestly, I'm not that smart a guy, but yet God has got a lot of vision inside of me. And there are people that are smarter than me, that are more gifted than me, more inspired, administrative than me, that actually work for me in many different situations. At this point, we need to all know our place. And our place is in Christ. And that our place isn't to elevate our own lives or our own strengths and point at everybody else's weaknesses. And in Matthew chapter 4, here's Jesus, who knew all of it. He even knew the end before the beginning. And now the first place that God the Father, God the Son is moved into, and the Holy Spirit fills him in, is to overcome the enemy. The first place, the first act that God has in the destiny of Jesus, in his ministry, is not to go over there and platform himself, have a great big, uh, you know, great big preaching session, or have some kind of healing ministry. The first thing was is to overcome the enemy. And yet today, I see so many people that are 
succumbing to the enemy. You need to overcome the devil. You need to overcome the devil. In John, the first, the epistle of John, it says there are three stages in, there's, in the Christian growth. One, you're a child of God. I want to grow up. I want my kids to grow up. I want my marriage to grow up. I want this church to grow up. Second phase, you young men overcome the evil one. So if you're not overcoming the evil one, in the spirit realm, you're not even considered a youth. If you really want to grow up, the second phase of your walk is to step on the devil, tell him where he belongs, tell him he doesn't belong in your friends, doesn't belong in your marriage, doesn't belong in your children, doesn't belong in your finances, doesn't belong on your health. Doesn't belong in any of that. You need to say, look, you need to know your place, devil, and that place is behind me and underneath me. But in front of me, Christ, because he's where I'm lifted, he's where I'm moved. My eyes are fixed on him. I'm going in his direction, and I'm going to create a wake where you're pushed out. And that I believe that we need to raise up disciples that have that same kind of faith and trust in God today. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus, three th- temptations that I believe every one of us will have to overcome. The first one is, he's hungry. First one is, he's hungry. He's fasting for 40 days. He's not hungry for the things of this world. He's hungry for God. And the temptation comes across, and Satan goes over and says, man, why don't you turn that, you know, stone into bread? And Jesus says, man shall live by what? Every word from the Lord. Is your food God's word? I'm going to tell you something, when God knows my life at 4.45 in the morning, I'm going to ask, God wakes me up with the word of God. Inevitably, I'm woke up in the morning many different days of the week, and it's always the word of God. You need, your food needs to be the word of God. Everybody say amen. It needs to be God's word. Matthew 4, verse 1, then Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Feels like a lot like today. To be tempted by the devil. After he'd gone without food for 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. And the tempter came and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus replied, It is written forever, it remains written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Are you listening to what God's saying? Then the devil, because you know what? Satan doesn't quit. Then the devil took him away into the holy city of Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle high point of the temple. And he said, mockingly to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you to serve, to serve, care for, protect and watch over you. And they will lift you up on their hands <clears throat> and so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written forever and remains written, you shall not test the Lord your God. I'm going to tell you something right now. Satan is confusing people in the word of God. I'm going to say it again right now. Satan is confusing people. Satan used the word of God to try to confuse Jesus. Are you confused in the word of God? Satan used, I see churches today confused in the word of God. Because they're not following the same Holy Spirit that wrote and inspired the word of God. All scripture is written for reproof, for correction, for edification. All of it is written. What is the Lord working on your heart? Let me tell you something. God is never God going to be a God. God is a king. He's a victor. He is on the march. He's raising up a people. And if that's not the voice, he's not raising up a people that are hiding from the devil. He's raising up a people that are going to step on the devil. And what's happening today is we got a bunch of people that are so afraid of what's going to happen next. That is not God's voice. That is not God's voice. That is not God's voice. God is raising up a people that will overcome and speak to the devil. I'm not afraid of him. You shouldn't be afraid of him. You speak right back to him. He's afraid of the authority of who Christ is on the inside of your life. God is raising up us to be a people that are hungry and thirsty after him. And again, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the, all the kingdoms of the word, world and glory and splendor and magnificence and excellence of them. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you, Jesus, if you just fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, go away, Satan, for it is written, forever remains written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's why we're going to end this service and worship today. We are going to go over there and realize there's only one, one that belongs being worshipped. Amen?
And we are going to lift him up. We are going to worship him. And even as the numbers we are, and I pray that those who are streaming right now are going to worship him. Because I believe that God's presence and who he is deserves to be worshipped. Him only should we be worshiping. And so many of us, you know what worship is? It's when you're giving your thoughts, your intentions, your fears, your, your ideas, your dreams, your creativity. You're giving. That's who you worship. And boy, I tell you what, if we were going to go over there and give an, an assessment of what we worship, I don't think we'd really be happy with what we're worshiping today. Because we're giving so much thoughts and, we, and dreams and frustrations and everything else to what's going on in our world instead of to our creator, our God. And God says, I will not compete with the nonsense that is going on inside your head until you worship me and I am your design. I am your way. I am your life. I am your sustenance. Number two, God is taking people who are drawing near to him and making them ready to destroy the enemy. Are you drawing near are, you, are we ready to destroy COVID with Jesus? Are we ready to destroy all the confusion with Jesus? Are we ready to go over there and see Christ lifted up? We've got two miracles that are in this house right now. One's healed of, one's literally their body went septic. And then they just got on the worship team. And another one over there that had cancer and just been completely diagnosed free of it. Come on, let's give God praise. And yet so many people live in fear of even visiting a hospital because they could be in contact with COVID. Let me tell you something. Let me, and I'm going to share this thing on the on right. If the Bible says whatever you fear the most shall come upon you. I don't care if you're Christian or not Christian. You don't belong with fear inside of your being. You must cast all fear out. If you allow fear in, I don't care. The very thing that you fear. The Bible says, Job says, the very thing I feared the most has come upon me. We cannot be Christians and allow fear into our being. We cannot allow worry. Jesus, what are you worried about? I'm with you. I'm for you. But yet so many of us are allowing the things, the elements of this world, world fear, confusion. These are all of the enemy. This is what, these are real things that we're living. And God says, overcome these because greater trials are coming. China just had to go over there, just, just going on China. People right now, if they're on unemployment in China, if they're in, in a place of need from the government, they have been told, it says, they cannot belong to Christ. They have to renounce their faith or they will not receive any state aid, any governmental assistance. This is right, I mean, people of God, this is the era in what we're living today. What would you do? Some of us, I think, want more, more, we're more attached to the unemployment than we are attached to Christ being the provider, Jehovah Jireh. Number three, the last day outpouring versus the last day gloom and doom. Do you believe the last day outpouring? God promised it. In Matthew chapter 24, and I'm almost finished, verse 3 through 14, later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when will this all happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And I, I mean, if we, many of us believe that it's coming, right? But if it's coming, then why aren't we talking about him? If, if it, I mean, if you think about it, if, if we believe Jesus Christ is coming back, then why aren't we talking? Why is it not grieving us that somebody else that's right next door to us that doesn't know him or her doesn't know him? Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. Many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars, threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place and the end won't, and the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation. Kingdom will against kingdom. There will be famines. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only a first birth pain with more to come. Do you see it's going to get better or is it going to get worse? Then you'll be arrested, you'll be persecuted and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and they even hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures, the one who has a fight inside of them because Christ lives on the inside of them. The one, it says the one who endures till the end will be saved and he and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it and that the end will then the end will come well how are you going to be able to preach that ending 
passage. How are you going to preach that power on the inside? Only because the Holy Spirit is so filled. Joel chapter 2 says this way. It's a promise. It's then after doing all those signs, these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons, daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days I'll pour out my spirit even on servants, men, women alike. And I'll cause wonders in the heaven and in the earth. Blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will become dark. The moon will turn blood red before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. But everyone, everyone, everybody say everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. For some on Mount Zion and Jerusalem will escape just as the Lord has said. These will be among the survivors whom the Lord has called. I'm going to tell you something. God is raising up a people that will preach the good news. God is raising up a people that will be full of the Holy Spirit. God is raising up a people right now that are going to go over there and say, I don't care how doom and gloom it is on the outside. I want to go over there and press in through all of it. Because Christ, you live. You're still on the throne. You didn't get off the throne. You're still on the throne. So that means maybe it's going to take a little harder work in my prayer closet. Maybe a little harder work in my, in my worship. But I'm going to press through all the doom and gloom. And I want to go over there and make a highway of blessing, a highway of praise and worship, a highway of faith, so that when people get around me throughout the day, they don't see me, they don't see doom and gloom, they see Christ that liveth in me. Yeah. Number four, God is making his bride ready. He's making his bride ready. This is going to be a hard word for all of you to hear right now. It's a hard word for me. As Jesus was tested, so will you be tested. 1 Peter 4.12 said this, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trial you're going through as if something strange was happening. Instead, be glad. For these trials have your par- make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. For the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, if it must be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs, my goodness, isn't that what people are doing today? Get off the Facebook. Stop pointing at other people. That's people's affairs. Prying in. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time has come for judgment. And it must begin with people. You can't judge. You can't judge. God said right here it's time for judgment. To begin with the house of God. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to the godless sinners? So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep doing it. What is right? And trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail. Last week, I had, um, in the second service, it wasn't in the first service, but the uh, Lord had me share um, a sin in my life. And I didn't even really see it for what it was. And uh, what happened was is that I was, um, many of you guys know that I, I rent boats and stuff. Well, somebody was asking me a question. A simple question. You go, what year is it? And, and, st- and right away I got insecure. Anybody ever get insecure in life? You got, all you are so secure. Yeah, Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the question just hit me off guard, and instead of just quieting myself and be assured in Christ and assured in what God has in my life, I, I, I um, stretched the truth, which is a lie. I said, was it 2008? It's a 2007. What's the difference? But inside of me, my insecurity spoke instead of Christ. You know, I've had that in my marriage. I've had that in, in my, with my children. Too many times when I get in a place I wasn't prepared, insecurity, or, or maybe it isn't insecurity, maybe it's fear, maybe it's um, um, anger or frustration. I hear so many people talking out of so many different voices today, but it isn't Christ. And so I, I'm, I'm sharing my fallacy. I, I, right away, that moment when it happened, I said, God, I'm sorry. I just lied. I'm sorry. And, you know, and I'm, I was cleansed immediately from it. And I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit was there because, you know, it's so, so important. And I love what David said. He goes, God, what is man that thou art mindful of me? And you know what, God, his presence was right there, and it healed me of that crazy that dialogue that that took me three seconds 
But do you know that Satan wanted to use those three seconds against me? I know I'm speaking to you right now. Because some of you have said some things that are off color. Some of you have done things that are off color. And those three seconds that you, instead of taking them to the cross, you let them take you into the grave. That's where Satan wants you. Instead of releasing it to God, God is faithful, you're not. I'm, God is faithful, I'm not. He is faithful. It's, does it, I am not who I am because of my faithfulness. I am not who I am because of my knowledge of the word. I am not who I am because the Holy Spirit lives in me. I am who I am because Christ lives in me. How much am I going to allow him to live in me today? How much am I going to allow him to have my heart? And then you know what? Even my failures. And some of you right now in this room right now, you're, you're only coming to God and you're coming with God with like your resume and that you only want to give God your good. Like God can't see your bad. Are you serious? you got to give him the whole deal. The whole deal. God, that's the rim that God is looking for. He says he can't trust you until you give him your all. And that is everything that's wrong with you. And believe me, there's probably more than you want to think about. Just like there is with me. And even more, everything is right with you. Because even the things that, even things that are right with me are still only proportionately right. Because I see dimly, Amen. So anything that's good in my life is because Christ that lives in my life. What could I ever brag about? What could I ever stand on that would be worth standing on other than Jesus Christ? His cross that he bore for my life. And I want that more in my life. I want his blood. I want the cross. I want the Holy Spirit to live in my life more than I ever have. Not because I'm desperate and things are rough. No, because I long to be his assignment, his way, his plan, his design. Because there are so many people outside these doors right now, and even in these doors, that don't know him. God, here I am. Here you are. Will you be that remnant today? Will you allow yourself in? Or are we just going to go from one trial? God didn't save you. Just so you can be an awesome mom and an awesome wife. And you didn't put you by her side so that you can go over there and be the strong man that you are. You have an assignment with Jesus Christ. You have an assignment to testify of his greatness and of his power. And that right now, as much as you pressed in to get healed of that cancer, you press in for the next assignment. Because the testimony that's living on the inside of you is because of the outdoors, what's going on. Somebody else needs to hear that Christ liveth and moveth and having been today. Amen? Would you please bow your heads right now? Father, I thank you. Lord, that it's intensity because, Lord, Satan's coming out with all of his intensity. And so we stand up, Lord God, not in our own strength. We stand up in the presence of who you are. You are our king. You are our life. You are our forgiveness. You are our hope. You are our love. You are our joy. You are our peace. You are the one that literally clears up the confusion. You bring brighter days. You bring strength in our arms to hold on. You wipe away our tears. You bring healing inside of our bodies. You resurrect us in newness of life. You, you put a word of hope inside of us when there's despair trying to grip us all around. One word from you, God, dispels all darkness. We love you, God. For you, for any of you this morning, or maybe that are watching right now that aren't right with Jesus, fear grips your life. God said Jesus came down on this earth thousands of years ago so that you wouldn't have to live in fear, you wouldn't have to live in confusion, that you could have blessed assurance that Jesus is yours. And all you need to do is surrender your life. Like all of us Christians now, we don't surrender once, we continually surrender our lives into the potter's hands. You say today, Pastor, I'm, I wanna surrender my life. Did anybody here say, I wanna surrender my life into the potter's hands? I want you to raise your hand nice and high. Thank you for the hand, thank you for the hand. Thank you for that. Anybody else said, that's me. 
Thank you for the hand back there. All right, church family, let's pray with them. Say, Father God, in Jesus' name, I surrender my life into your hands. Lord Jesus, I receive your forgiveness for my sins. I am all yours. Daddy in heaven, I know you have assignments. Give me eyes to see. Give me ears to hear. Give me a perceptive heart to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.